This is the colorful slide that George Daly was talking about. Uh, and it is a thank you slide as much as it is a conflict of interest slide. Uh, and thank you, uh, all of you and everybody that helps turn our uh, sometimes half-baked or crazy ideas into things that actually have an impact in, in society. And uh, we've been fortunate that, that many of the things we work on turn out to be exponential technologies. And what that means is it can change by two to tenfold per year. So they're going exponentially improving in quality and, and price um, faster than electronics, which is already a, a mind-boggling uh, rate of change. To, and this includes reading, writing, and editing of DNA, 10 million-fold change in price, and somehow people still manage to make uh, money on it even after it's brought the price down 10 million-fold. And so we brought the $3 billion genome, which everybody talks about as Genome Project, I'm embarrassed by. I was, I, I was not a big, I even started it in 1984, but, um, I wanted to bring the price down. It did eventually come down to, uh, to uh, less than $1,000 about four years ago, and Veritas Genomics was one of the companies that provided genetic counseling. But now we think we've, we've got a business model where we can uh, give away genomes for zero dollars. And, and this, like many things I'll mention today, may, may seem uh, science fiction, at when, uh, but it is, many of these things are past or present tense. And you think of this like uh, uh, maps and search on the internet. Those are free to the consumer. Somebody has to pay for it. But uh, with genetics, there are a few ways uh, that we've discovered that I think are uh, plausible. So uh, these are just technically, these were all done not by filling a room full of machines or technicians, but by uh, reducing it so that one tube, one pipette, one, whatever you have, now does billions of reactions um, with the same effort of doing one. So it doesn't, you can scale that up if you want to the size of a room, but the important thing is we scale it down to billions of reactions in a single small tube. Now the themes that I'd just like to develop here, uh, arguments in a certain sense, is there's uh, a, an immediately accessible uh, revolution in genetics we don't have to wait for, which is monogenic or Mendelian diseases. These are so-called simple, nothing simple, but uh, these can be done by uh, orphan drugs, by gene therapy, and I would, uh, I constantly uh, encourage us to think about genetic counseling as a cost-effective alternative to gene therapy, even though a huge fraction of my research is on gene therapy. But you can bring down the cost in, in ways we'll talk about in a moment. Then there's the alternative, which is multigenic, multifactorial, environmental, and these are sometimes called common or complex or chronic diseases, and, and I think many of these should be or are being rebranded as aging, diseases of aging. Ninety percent of us in industrialized nations will die of, uh, of these kind of diseases, but it doesn't necessarily, just because it's a complex disease doesn't necessarily mean it's a, a complex treatment, and I'll give an example of that. Um, and then there's the question of whether we're doing prevention, whether we're doing reversal, partial reversal, or full-time cure. We're mostly focusing on, on reversal, as you'll see in a moment. Um, and whether this is disease-specific, or we're taking one aging disease at a time, or whether we're coming up with a general set of aging-specific. Uh, and we can do this with cell therapies or, or uh, gene therapies. Now here's an example of the cla textbook classic multigenic trait, multi-environmental trait tens of thousands of, of single nucleotide polymorphisms, and it seems hopelessly complex both diagnostically and therapeutically, but there are some genes that have very large effects, and these turn out, these can be turned into therapies, most notably human growth hormone somatotropin, which is a uh, single gene, single gene product protein that uh, works on all these different uh, diseases used clinically. So, you might think this is a silly question for me to be asking, is human genomics useful today? But I, I will ask for audience participation. How many people here have their full human genome sequence available to them today? That is a truly remarkably high number and disappointingly low number. Uh, it's typically less than 1 percent in the audience, in it, and, but I will argue it is, is useful. But it's useful in a, in a curious way that we'll, that we'll get to. Um, it's, um, the cost for a, uh, one of these Mendelian diseases, and there are about 7,000 of them, has been estimated somewhere, depending on whether it's orphan drugs, uh, it can be 
$100,000 to $1 million per year per patient. So a lifetime bill might be as high as $20 million. And this very, the numbers vary. I give a citation here from, from Canadian uh, reference. But the point is it's, uh, it's high. And this can be recovered if we can avoid Mendelian diseases uh, through genetic counseling or other means. This can be preconception. It can be even premarital. Um, and the reason I'll say that this is quirky is I think it's analogous to seatbelts, is we have, uh, we had, seatbelts were essentially free. They were standard equipment. They were required by law. There was ad campaigns. Nevertheless, people did not buckle up until this little piece of technology was, in, it was added to the seatbelt, which the seatbelt wasn't just a passive uh, lock. It actually triggered a circuit and stopped an annoying sound. So we need the equivalent of an annoying sound for human genetics, which, like seatbelts, only 1% of people will extremely benefit, but that 1% will be, is such a big deal that they should do it. And you don't know that you're going to be safe, that you won't be one of the million people a year that dies of, of car accidents or Mendelian diseases. Now, when we do gene therapy, we have options of addition, subtraction, precise editing, and epigenetic, meaning regulatory. Uh, there's been a lot of attention recently to CRISPR, which is mostly subtractive, but I, would, I think we need to think about the whole uh, gamut of possible interventions. And for aging, uh, we've heard a, a, a beautiful uh, description of some and show some of the data behind this uh, nine or ten different pathways that are critical for um, longevity and or aging reversal. Um, but, but, it turned, but we have such deep knowledge of these, so, so you can look at a half empty, half full, but we have such deep knowledge, I think that we can start turning these into therapies quite easily, and in, in, the, in the route that we've taken uh, is gene therapies, you'll see in a moment. And this includes um, uh, you know, reduction of cells that have genomic damage or are senescent, the telomeres, uh, the protein regulation, caloric restriction, you've heard of many of these uh, already. So I'm going to go through very, very quickly. Just to, I just want you to, uh, uh, to see eight or nine examples here um, and look for the word reversal in here because I just I wanted to say that, uh, that this is past tense. We have examples already uh, shown in animal models, and now we want to convert these into uh, therapies that are suitable, safe, and effective for humans. So here's, here's a couple of examples of small molecules, rapamycin, metformin. I think Nir will be talking about this uh, later on. Um, here's an example where there's four transcription factors, more about transcription factors at the moment, that regulate processes. Um, and, um, and these have now been turned from something used in cell, bio cell biology in the, tissue, in the tissue culture plates into an experiment that has been done in mice where you get amelioration of many age-associated hallmarks. Telomerase can do reversal. and in and in particular cases, if you have cancer-resistant mice uh, messing around with uh, tumor suppressor genes, you can also have telomerase have its impact without much risk. Um, we've heard about the uh, synolytic uh, methodology, uh, the P16 pathway. Um, there are actually the, the dark matter of the genome, the repeat repetitive elements have been implicated in, um, in this sort of senescence. And we, we have a lot of work on almost every major category of repetitive elements. These are the parts that most genome people don't want you to talk about. It's like the uh, bad secret. Um, limb regeneration happens in some animals. Uh, and there is efforts to, to, to see if this can be uh, translated into various regenerative uh, methods in humans. There is this heterochronic parabiosis, which is jargon for uh, uh, fusing t the circulatory systems of two animals uh, and, or just taking the, the blood itself. And this has been shown to be uh, valuable for reversing uh, cardiac and skeletal muscle, um, neuronal function, and bone. Another synolytic, every time you can count the number of atoms, that means it's a small molecule, but our emphasis is on larger molecules. Um, uh, this is work from David Sinclair, uh, with whom we collaborate, and it's a, it's a segue into uh, the first of our large molecules. This is a mitochondrial pathway, 
which George Daly mentioned, uh, the Hagus group is working on, as well as David's. Um, and this is nicotinamide uh, is, a, is a one way of restoring the inevitable de decline in a number of small and large molecules that, that drop um, between age six and 22 months in mice and, and uh, corresponding aging in humans. So we uh, tackled one step in this, the TFAM down at the bottom there, uh, which results in loss of mitochondrial homeostasis, and we decided we would tackle it directly. Now using CRISPR not in its normal role, which is hatchet man, uh, where it just kills genes, but in this case we knocked out the nuclease and attached it to a, a regulatory domain so it can now imitate uh, transcriptional activator regulators and targeted for four different sites upstream for the TFAM, which itself is a transcription factor regulator. Sorry if there's too many levels of regulation here, but it's, uh, it's all good because we managed to restore, there was a twofold decrease in mitochondrial function uh, via this pathway. We restored this uh, up to eightfold, which is more than we need, and so we have uh, some working room for, um, for uh, other, uh, for modulating this. One of the advantages I, I should mention that one of the reasons we keep getting attracted to, um, to gene therapy is that it is something that unlike small molecules or even protein therapies, the orphan drugs, this is something you can do once in your lifetime and it can have a lasting effect. It's something that, that you can target very specifically to specific cells or even within a cell and, uh, and you can have feedback systems. It's a much more sophisticated drug and I think of it as like the difference between uh, a simple transistor and uh, a modern um, supercomputer. So what we've done to generalize that a bit, and uh, here we're restoring protein functions as, it, as they decline with age for the most part, uh, just by boosting them up. And so we looked through all the, all of the genes that have these sorts of properties, that have uh, experiments that, that have been done in a variety of animals that indicate that they are, um, uh, there's evidence for either longevity extension, sometimes up to uh, two-fold or more of the life span or aging reversal in various animals. And we then we, they're systematically turning those into uh, gene therapies, which is remarkably easy to get a proof of concept. Noah Davidson, uh, pictured here as a postdoctoral fellow, um, was almost single-handedly did 45 uh, gene therapies. Um, and then, and then using them in various combinations to see, because we want to get all of those nine or ten pathways of aging, um, because we think that it's naive to think that just one of those pathways will be sufficient, but it might not be that hard to get nine of them with a small number of genes. So using uh, two or three at a time, we have now, uh, NOAA has found uh, a combinatorial gene therapy uh, which is under review at Nature Biotechnology right now, which hits five out of five of these age-related diseases, which is indicative of, but is not uh, quite proof, that uh, this is getting at some fundamental aging process. So this is high-fat diet-based obesities. We're sort of inducing accelerated aging in many of these cases, type 2 diabetes, osteoarthritis, cardiac uh, damage uh, model recovery, and kidney damage. Now, part of the reason th those, those uh, gene therapies were restricted to, uh, to a, set, a subset of the genes in Pedro de Magalhaes' gene uh, age database. Uh, he was a previous postdoc in my lab. It was restricted to the subset, which are so-called non solitanos meaning that they, they have actions that spread to adjacent cells or throughout the body. That's a, that's a small subset, and it's because adeno-associated virus is not yet fully tamed. It is among the best delivery systems that we have. Uh, it is the most approved uh, method of, of gene therapy delivery, but it has room for improvement. And we have uh, now uh, combined machine learning, uh, artificial intelligence, and synthetic biology loop um, that allows us to uh, engineer now over a quarter of a million different viral designs. So these are not random designs, these are design, uh, uh, machine learning based uh, designs where we've made specific 
many specific changes to the AV virus looking for improved um, re resistance to uh, immune uh, problems and to uh, tissue distribution. So we can inject this mixture of, of engineered viruses into an animal and then take samples from throughout the body and find which tissues it's going to and, and develop new, um, uh, new viruses. And this is the work of Pierce Ogden, who's a graduate student, Eric Kelsick, who is a postdoc in, in transition. The hypothesis that we have, uh, one of the hypotheses that we're using in this work is that we can go from almost any cell type and age to almost any other, notably from pluripotent stem cells to, uh, to any other tissue. And uh, we have examples where you can go from 70, 80-year-old tissue to almost embryonic in, in the other direction. And the most dramatic case of this is Bruce Yankner's paper on, on which I was a co-author. Um, that just came out a few days ago, uh, George Daly mentioned Bruce's work on a different subject, where we could take, a spon <coughs> we can take uh, people with Alzheimer's disease, late onset and so-called sporadic, uh, and healthy age match controls and, sh and establish stem cells for each of them and, and show that their RNAs are almost identical, which is a nice control for the next step where we turn them into neuronal progenitor cells and neuronal networks and now they're dramatically different. So even though the sporadic means that by definition they don't have the classic genetic uh, markers, um, we can nevertheless uh, classify uh, these into people that will get Alzheimer's and those that don't. And more important than just the diagnostic component here is that we can use this as a, a, for testing new, uh, new therapies. So here's an example of differentiating uh, human pluripotent stem cells. These actually are or from my body, it's uh, more ethical to do experiments on me than for me to do experiments on my students. But anyway, this is Alex M and Paris Dudikoskalaga are, are, are recipients of Blavatnik support, early adopters in this uh, accelerator, very grateful. Uh, and here is producing endothelial cells and bipolar neurons, initially in separate uh, media, and, and then later combined together. This was actually harder than it looks. All those little red lines are very thin capillaries, uh, five microns, just like the capillaries in your body. There's, a, there's almost an equal number of uh, capillaries and neurons in your brain, uh, little known fact, 86 billion of each, and that's what you're seeing here is you have these big uh, nuclei for the, for the neurons and the, and the smaller uh, red capillaries floating through them, the blue nuclei for the neurons. We also have, so that's an intimate connection between two different cell types that we de developed from a single cell type. And here's two other ones where the oligodendrocytes wrap the neurons with myelin. You may have heard of this as speeding up the uh, conductances through the, the nerves that go through the white matter in your brain so you can go long distances at high speed. Um, this is beautiful wrapping that looks just like natural. So the, one of the example of a success story for gene therapy is CAR T cells. Hopefully you've heard of this. Uh, this is not only a way to, uh, for T cells to fight uh, a variety of cancers, but it, it kind of shows off how gene therapy, sorry, how genetic editing can help with gene therapy in, in making them much more immune compatible so you can actually transplant from any person to any other person, so sometimes called allogeneic or universal cells. And we generalize this even further from any person, any person, to any animal, to any person. And we're in the process of testing this as now. Um, we made uh, dozens of changes in the pigs to make them humanized and, and um, missing the endogenous retroviruses so they are less of a risk. Um, and this is now in uh, preclinical trials in non-human primates at, at MGH and other places using these pigs. Uh, and to do this, we had to overcome a uh, natural inclination for cells to die when they are cut multiple times with CRISPR. Uh, we made so many changes to the cells, we had to develop ways to stabilize them and make them uh, happy with that number of edits. And we've now uh, set the record at 62, and the new record is now at uh, 15,000 edits in a single cell. It's not published yet. You heard it here first. Um, and finally, I just want to say that it, the, part of the attraction for engineering organs is not just to deal with the incredible worldwide shortage, 
where millions of people could benefit, it's the opportunity to do something that's very hard to do in humans, whether the human organ donors or just humans in a preventative medicine sense, which is to make us resistant to multiple pathogens, to make us cancer resistant, senescence resistant, immunity um, that we've been talking about, and even cryopreservation if you want to bank away organs. This is very hard to do, but we know how to do it in animals, so what if we could transplant it from animals to humans? And I, and here's some examples of some animals that can survive uh, through f uh, full body freezing. So that's all I want to say. The thanks again, um, not just to the students and postdocs I mentioned along the way, but here's Bruce Yankner, who, who, who's helped us with a number of these neurodegenerative diseases, and Jennifer Lewis, who's helped with the um, Morgan. So uh, thank you very much, and uh, open it up for questions. Thank you.